having me again. So let's remind ourselves what we uh, finished doing last time. So let's let x be a smooth. So last time we did any variety, but I'm this time now I'm going to restrict to proper varieties, smooth proper variety over a global field k. And so our goal was to figure out how to determine whether there were k rational points, um, but we didn't know how to do that. Um, well, maybe we don't know how to do that right away. So what we tried to do were to find some larger sets that were easier to compute that this contained. So first we had the set of adelic points, then we defined uh, the brower monon obstruction. Probably left way too much space here. Yes. And then we refined that even further with the H. Halbrauer obstruction. And we showed that all of these were contained in, uh, contained the k rational points. We also mentioned that, um, you know, this is what you, what we define when we're just considering things theoretically, but for computational reasons, it often also makes sense to put in this possibly larger set, the algebraic Brouwer set, which fits inside here, it's because this generally is easier to compute and sometimes that already does the job. For instance, if this is already empty, then we're good. Okay, so these are all necessary conditions. Given a set of equations, we can successively check, okay, is this not empty? Is this not empty? Is this not empty? Is this not empty? We get to here and the, we say, okay, is this not empty? And then what? <laughs> what do we do? So if we know it's not empty, do we, should we then expect that there's a K point? What happens? So we really uh, want to know when these are sufficient or when these are sufficient conditions. So we know that they're, they're not always sufficient conditions. We saw or at least I said that there are examples that show that all of these containments can be strict. Um, but maybe for particular types of varieties, they can be sufficient. Okay, but it also doesn't ask to make whether, make sense to ask whether it's sufficient for a particular variety. Well, okay, it makes sense, but it's not that useful, right? Because say your variety has no adelic points. Yes, then it is sufficient, I mean, it's not satisfied, but <laughs> it's sufficient. So we don't want to ask whether these conditions are sufficient for a given variety. We want to ask whether they're sufficient for a class of varieties. So uh, our question now is to um, determine classes of varieties, or I'm going to say a class, of varieties S such that um, so either maybe all the varieties in S satisfy the Hasse principle. So if you have adelic points, then you have a K point. Does this satisfy Hasse principle? Maybe they have, if the Brouwer set is not empty, then that, so these are fill in the blank list. Okay, I'm not saying all of these at once because just pick which one. So multiple questions. This will say brouwer monin is the only obstruction or maybe uh, brouwer monin obstruction is sufficient. We could also put Brouwer 1 and then say algebraic brouwer monin obstruction. And then we can also ask for the HL brouwer set. And then we'll say a tall brower is the only obstruction or is sufficient. Okay, but so, so we'd like to do this and we'd like to figure out, you know, how to make S as large as possible. But still this right now is a um, very vague question and I could stupidly do it by just saying, okay, I'm going to let S be the set of all varieties that satisfy the Haas principle. It's not what I want. Probably you all guessed that, but Yes. So we want, maybe one way to think about it is that we would like to define a, 
class of varieties in a way which doesn't use any arithmetic to define the set. That we can, without knowing anything about the arithmetic at the beginning, we can just check that they're in this class of varieties and then deduce these properties. So maybe if we can get some, some so ideally, S would be described purely geometrically, without any regard to the arithmetic. So that's one way to make sure that I'm not giving you a stupid definition of a set, where it's just tautological. Okay, so what are some examples of this? Well, for instance, you can take S to be all quadric hypersurfaces. So this is the Hasse-Minkowski theorem um, that when you take this set, the Hasse principle holds for S. Okay, so I just give you an equation. This is something I can check in the geometry. I'm saying that it's given uh, just as the vanishing of a single equation in projective space, and that equation has degree two. It has nothing to do with the arithmetic. What's another example? Well, if S is genus, all genus one curves, then Manin showed that assuming, I'm just gonna fit this in here, finiteness of Shaw of all elliptic curves, then brouwer manin is the only obstruction. for this. So if you have any genus one curve, again, that's a condition that you can check purely geometrically. You don't, you're not saying anything about the arithmetic. And if we know this conjecture that um, the teixeira freyevich group of an elliptic curve is, of all elliptic curves are finite, then we know immediately. Yes? Yes, exactly. So what he actually proved is that if you're given a genus one curve, if Shaw of the Jacobian of that curve is finite, then non-empty Brouwer set implies the existence of a k-rational point. Uh, I just phrased it this way because I made this big stink about not saying anything about a particular variety. <laughs> so <laughs> I kind of painted myself into a corner, but okay. So why would we even expect that it's possible to determine a class of varieties? These are arithmetic statements. Why would it be possible to give a class just defined purely in terms of geometry where this would be true? Like why should we even expect that that's true? So I mean one answer is just that we have a lot of examples where that is in fact true. So I said ideally, as Tony said, we can ask for anything. We can ask for it. Okay, but um, another thing is perhaps surprisingly, having a K point is actually a birational invariant, a K birational invariant. So this is the Lang Nishimura theorem. I guess these are separate papers. Lang Nishimura. So uh, f from x to y, make sure I get my, uh, this is a rational map of k schemes. And if y is proper and x is smooth, oh sorry, x has a smooth k point, then y has a k point. Okay, so then if you assume that x and y are both smooth and proper, and this is a birational map, then you get that x has a k point if and only if y has a k point. Okay, and uh, this is actually, this is true for any k, not just global fields. So, yes, I sketched the proof. So this proof is due to, due to Kolar and Sabo. So the proof is induction 
on the dimension of x. So if x is zero dimensional, then a rational map is just a morphism, so it's immediate. It's just defined on the k point. Okay, maybe let me say what's wrong. What's the, what could possibly go wrong is that your k point could be outside of the set where this, where this morphism is defined. Okay, of course if k is, if the map is defined on the point, then we just map it over and we're done. But so the problem is if it's not defined on the point. That's what we're trying to figure out. But if you have a rational map from a zero dimensional scheme, then it's a morphism. So there's no, nothing to prove. So I'll call that dimension n. So n equals zero is done. Okay, so let's look at n greater than zero. Well then I'm gonna blow up at this point. So let x prime be the blow up of x. I guess this is actually just the proof anyway. Okay, so we get this map to y. And then because y is proper, this composition The composition is defined uh, outside of a codimension at least two set. So that means that you can restrict this map to the exceptional divisor and get a rational map from the exceptional divisor. So you get a rational map. The exceptional divisor I blew up at a smooth k point, so this is just projective space of one lower dimension. That definitely has a smooth k point. I proceed by induction. Do you need to like formalize that first? Um, I don't think so. I think just enough from, from properness. Because I just look at the, um, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> many, many options. <laughs> I just say at the beginning it was just a sketch, so. Okay. Exercise. <laughs> so, all right, so the corollary, as I stated, is that if, um, yeah, if this is now X and Y are smooth and proper and this is birational, then one has a k point if and only if the other one has a k point. Okay, so at least having a k point is a k birational invariant. And it's also true, uh, I forget whether in the paper this is a theorem or a proposition, but this is in the paper I mentioned uh, yesterday of Kolotilen, Paul, and Skorbogachev. They proved that if x and y are smooth, proper, and k birational, then the non-emptiness of the Brouwer set is also a birational invariant. So, and also the same thing for the HL Brouwer set. Uh, oh, and this was in K is a number field. Okay. So um, let me just point out, so I said this in my notes, but I didn't, haven't mentioned it at all. If X is proper, then you can prove that all of these subsets are closed in the adelic topology. So they also give you an obstruction to approximating a k-point by an adelic point. It's not only a question of existence, but you could also ask about the closure of this set and the adelic topology and which adelic points you hit. So this question is much more difficult um, to ask the analogous statement about um, about weak approximation. So asking whether the k points are dense in this set or whether the k points of y are dense in this set, it's not, it's a harder question whether or not that's a birational invariant. So 
I forgot to write this down, but you can ask Lois Len because he's here. Um, I think if you know that the Brouwer group on constants is finite, then you get the statement for weak approximation. See around nodding. Okay, well, you can ask him. I think that's the statement, but uh, yeah, in general, that's a harder question. So I'm just gonna focus on about the existence. Okay, so this is maybe some evidence that it's not completely crazy to try to hope that you can find sets like this that are described geometrically. Many of these properties are k-birational invariants. Okay, so my lecture series title is Rational Points on Surfaces. So we're going to first restrict to the class of surfaces and then try to figure out how to divide them up further. But to do that, I need to tell you about the classification of surfaces. So we're sticking to smooth and proper surfaces and uh, Zariski proved that every smooth proper surface is also projective. So we're doing the classification of smooth projective surfaces. Okay, and I'm not going to assume K is algebraically closed, but I am going to assume that K is characteristic zero. Most of the statements are true. Some funny things go wrong in characteristic two or three, but I just don't want to worry about that. Uh, Okay, so what's the coarsest measure we have of the complexity of a surface? Well, that's something called the Kodaira dimension. So this is actually defined not only for surfaces, but is there a question? Okay. Okay, so given any x, so you're over, uh, number field, we don't know, you know what kind of points you have, what kind of proper separates you have over your number field, but one thing we do always have is the canonical sheaf or the canonical divisor. So that's the only information we know is handed to us. Uh, so that's what we work with first. So let's consider the map, so omega x is the canonical sheaf. And I'm going to give have the map uh, given by the complete linear system associated to powers of the canonical sheaf, so it goes from X to the projective space of sections of omega X to the N. So we can just look at this, you know, well, for all N or N sufficiently large, whatever you want. And you can look how this um, map behaves as you increase n, and particularly what the dimension of the image is. Okay, so the Kodaira dimension of x, which is denoted kappa of x, is equal to the maximum of the dimension of the image of this map, the maximum as you range over n, assuming that this map is even defined. So as long as h0 x omega x tensored with n is non-empty for n sufficiently large. And otherwise, we just say that it's negative infinity uh, or maybe just negative. Okay, so this is some very coarse measure that you can just consider right away. I hand you a projective variety. You look at the canonical sheaf, look at these powers, see what happens. So uh, one thing to just note is that the Kodaira dimension, by definition, is uh, contained, well, it takes values either minus infinity or from zero up to n, uh, n being the dimension of x. Not this little n. So there's some finite set of values. And if you look at the case of curves, one then I mean, if you've never seen Kodaira dimension before, you might be asking yourself, well, whether, I mean, yes, I can do it, but maybe it's some weird division, but it actually follows ones that you know about. So for curves, the possibilities are negative infinity, zero, and one, 
and this agrees negative infinity is genus zero curves, could I would mention one, is genus one curves, and could a uh, genus greater than or equal to two is could I would mention one. And probably you've all seen lots of statements that are divided, you know, this is true for genus zero curves or genus one or genus greater than or equal to two. There's many arithmetic statements that follow this division. Okay, uh, let me just mention, so if the Kodaira dimension is the maximal thing possible, if it's equal to the dimension of x, then we say that x is general type. Okay, so those are the most complicated um, varieties geometrically. Um, it's this name we give them. Basically, we can't say anything about them besides this. <laughs> Just give them a name and that's the classification. We're done with this. Okay, uh, let me mention how this relates to arithmetic. So the line conjecture, so these are the most complicated um, geometrically. The line conjecture says that they're also um, the most complicated arithmetically. Well, okay. I don't know what it means. Well, let me say what it, this conjecture says. So if X is general type, then the rational points are not Zariski dense. Okay, so they're contained in some, the rational points are all contained in some finite number of lower dimensional subvarieties. So the ones of general type, we should really not expect to have any rational points at all. Let me point out, um, that if, if the Brouwer group mod constants is finite, then this set is both open and closed in the adelic topology. So this will never cut out finitely many points with just, uh, or it will never cut out a Zariski closed subset with a finite Brouwer mod Brouwer zero. Okay, so if Brouwer Ronin is going to con control everything, which probably it doesn't, um, but you at least need, you need many more things. Th these obstructions, they may not control everything, but if they even have to have a chance, they have to be way more complicated. So maybe that's some notion of being more complicated arithmetically. Um, I didn't get to mention this yesterday, but actually, uh, Prior to the introduction of the Atal Brouwer obstruction, Sarnak and Wang in 95 showed that if the Lang conjecture holds, then there exist uh, smooth hypersurfaces. a very high degree, smooth hypersurface is X, where the brouwer monon obstruction can't possibly control everything, not empty. Okay, so conditionally, even before Skorbogachev introduced his finer obstruction and before Poonin uh, showed that even this finer obstruction was enough, it was suggested that this should not be able to possibly control everything uh, I will say that these hypersurfaces have to be dimension at least three. So for surfaces, uh, we didn't have even conjectural evidence. The first evidence was the examples of Harpaz and Skorbogacha. Okay. All right, so this is our first rough division for our Kodaira dimension. And we're mostly going to focus on uh, surfaces of low Kodaira dimension. As the Kodaira dimension gets higher, it's harder to say anything. Uh, so probably depending, probably I won't get to say anything about Kodaira dimension one or two. So 
So let's start with surfaces of negative Hodira dimension. So then there's a theorem, which I think is usually attributed to Enriquez, which is that if x is a smooth projective surface with negative Podira dimension, then over the algebraic closure, x is ruled. So x bar is ruled. So what does this mean? This means that there exists a smooth projective curve C and a morphism F from X bar to C such that the generic fiber is isomorphic to P1 over. So the generic fiber of this map is isomorphic to P1. Okay, so these uh, I Oh yes, that's a good point. So yeah, let's do a rational map. Thanks. Okay. So let's, so this, remember I wanna know about the classification over a number field because I want to think about what is happening over a number field. So this gives me a condition, but it tells me what happens when I base change to the algebraic closure. So I would like to know, well, what sorts of things happen over my ground field? Do I still have this map? What is the generic, maybe I never have this, maybe I don't have this map, maybe uh, I have the map, but the um, generic fiber is different. So what happens, well, I think in the interest of time, I'll just put this as a proposition. So there's a proof in the notes. So let's assume smooth projective surface with Kodaira dimension negative and assume that X bar is ruled. So it's definitely ruled, but ruled over a positive genus curve. So then there exists a smooth projective uh, curve C over K with the genus being positive um, and a map F from X. This one is actually a morphism. F from X to C over K such that uh, the generic fiber is genus zero. So we'll take this to mean that X is a conic bundle. I'm just gonna make this the definition, conic bundle over a positive genus curve. Okay, so if you have, if this ruling map maps to something of positive genus, then actually we know that we can already find this map over, over uh, K. We don't necessarily get that the generic fiber will be isomorphic to P1, but it will be genus zero. Okay, and the reason why these are called conic bundles is because you can find an embedding that embeds every fiber as a conic. So um, I give a reference in the notes to, um, an article of Brendan Hassett, and he titles this corollary, Conic Bundles Are Conic Bundles. <laughs> so, justifies the name. Okay, so if your Kodaira dimension, um, have Kodaira dimension negative, and you're ruled over a positive genus curve, which is the same as saying that you're non-rational, because if you're ruled over genus zero, then you would be geometrically rational, then you actually have this map over your ground field. And let me just remind you that this example of Kolitulan, Pal, and Skorobogatov says that for these types of surfaces, we can't hope for any of these obstructions to control anything. So we're just gonna ignore these um, 
services for the rest of my series because all we know is that everything we know right now is not good enough. And I haven't learned anything new since their paper that would help us, so <laughs> just move those aside and look at the ones that we think we can say something for. Okay, so now we're left with the surfaces of negative Kodaira dimension, which are geometrically rational, that are ruled over a genus zero curve over the algebraic closure. Yes? Question? No? Okay. All right, so the rational surfaces, we have a classification theorem of Vyskovsky, which says that if x bar is rational, so those are the ones left over, then either x is birational to a conic bundle over genus zero curve, so a rational conic bundle, or the anti-canonical bundle, which is omega x inverse, is ample. And in which case, we say that x is a del Pezzo surface. So this is the definition of a del Pezzo surface. It's a geometrically rational surface. Uh, well, oh, yeah, the first part is redundant. It's the one whose anti-canonical bundle is ample. Okay, and uh, you can be both. This is an inclusive or, not an exclusive or. Okay, um, and let me just explain. So, I mean, we just gave this a name. We just said, okay, all of these things with this property, we're going to call del Pezzo surfaces. But those we can also classify uh, further. So, okay, just say there is a further classification of this that you can read about in the notes. So maybe let's just some remarks. Is uh, every del Pezzo surface, the degree of a del Pezzo surface is the intersection of the canonical class and this is some number, integer between one and nine. Okay, and the del Pezzo surfaces of degree nine are the simplest, and then as you go down, it gets harder. So for these rational surfaces, we have a conjecture of Kolotolen and Sansuk so that if, uh, so that Brauermannen is the only obstruction for geometrically rational surfaces. So for rational conic bundles and del Pezzo surfaces. So, uh, and in this case, rational surfaces, uh, geometrically rational surfaces, their whole Brouwer group is algebraic because the Brouwer group of P2 over an algebraically, algebraically closed field is trivial so every Brouwer class on a geometrically rational surface becomes trivial over the algebraic closure. So this is the same as the algebraic Brouwer-Mannin obstruction being the only obstruction for geometrically rational surfaces. So when is this known? Well, unfortunately in not that many cases. So it's known for del Pezzo surfaces of degree greater than or equal to five. And actually, for these del Pezzo surfaces, there are there is no Brouwer group, so um, the brouwer mannin obstruction being the only obstruction is the same as the Hasse principle holding. So that's that's known, and actually that's what we prove. Well, not we like me, we mathematicians showed. It's also known um, for some con rational conic bundles. This is very big. Shouldn't even write this down. So the arguments depend on the number of degenerate fibers. And I think Kolotelen is going to discuss more about this in his lectures. So I'll leave that. 
and it's known conditionally on um, finiteness of Sha or elliptic curves and Schinzel's hypothesis. Schinzel for some Delpezzo surfaces of degree four. And that's basically it. So there's still, that's what we expect, but there's still, we're still a long way from proving it. Okay, so that's the classification of rational services. So I have very little time to give you a whirlwind tour of the services of Kodaira dimension zero. So in this case, we're going to assume that X is a minimal surface. So that means that it's not, there's no birational morphism from X to any other uh, surface over K. Then X is either, so there are four possibilities and unlike the classification in rational surfaces, these are mutually exclusive. So it's either a twist of an abelian surface something that's called a bioelliptic surface. So that means that when you base change to the algebraic closure, it's isomorphic to a product of elliptic curves mod a finite group where this group acts on E1 uh, by translation, it's contained in set of torsion, and it acts on E2 in such a way that the quotient is isomorphic to P1. Okay, so that's a bioelliptic surface. We have K3 surface, which by now you all know and love, and then an Enrique surface. So what is an Enrique surface? Well, I'll just define it by these uh, invariants that H1 of X O X, H0 of X omega X is zero. Okay, and these four are all, as I said, they're mutually exclusive. Okay, so a uh, the theorem, basically due to Manin plus an unwinding of definitions of what the Atal Brouwer obstruction is. So if you know finiteness of Sha for all abelian surfaces, Then uh, the brouwer manin obstruction is the only obstruction for twists of abelian surfaces. That's what Manin proved. And similar statement is what held for elliptic curves. And two, a tall brouwer is the only obstruction for bioelliptic surfaces. And this is the plus epsilon. Basically, you unwind the definition of atal Brouwer obstruction. You get that there's an atal cover, which is a twist of an abelian surface. You know Brouwer Manin is the only one there, and so atal Brouwer must be the only one on bioelliptic surface. Okay, and Skorbogatov, uh, this was his paper in 99 where he introduced the atal Brouwer obstruction. Um, there exists bioelliptic surfaces. with the Atal Brouwer set empty and the Brouwer set non-empty. So this theorem is the best theorem you can get for these classes of surfaces. Okay. Okay, so that takes care of those two. So we're left with K3 surfaces and Enrique surfaces. Um, so similarly to how the arithmetic of bioelliptic surfaces could be related to the arithmetic of twists of abelian surfaces, we get a similar story for K3 and Enrique surfaces. So you should really think of these sets as coming in pairs. So how does this work? 
Well, if y is a K3 surface, and you have a fixed point free involution of y, then uh, the quotient by this involution is an Enrique surface. And conversely, if x is an Enrique's, there exists a K3 and a fixed point free involution, fixed point free involution, such that, uh, oh, maybe I should just say it like this, and f from y to x an a tall double cover. Okay, so for every Enrique surface, you automatically get along for the right a K3 surface, which is uh, an a tall double cover of it. So this gives you a torsor over X under Z mod 2. Okay. So in the um, definition of a tall Brouwer, when you consider the a tall Brouwer set of an Enrique service, you are going to be forced to compute the Brouwer mountain obstruction on a K3 surface. Okay, and we also have a conjectural story here. So this is conjecture due to Skorobogatov that Brouwer Manin is the only obstruction uh, for K3 surfaces. And then a similar argument as I outlined here, this would imply that a tall Brouwer is the only obstruction. for Enrique services. Okay, so for services of Kodaira dimension zero and negative infinity, uh, okay, for so surfaces of Kodaira dimensions zero and geometrically rational surfaces, we at least have a complete conjectural picture of what we expect to happen, and it doesn't include um, these, these beyond Atal Brouwer examples, these examples where Atal Brouwer still doesn't give us everything. I should say, even though it looks like from the conjectural picture, the surfaces of Kodaira dimension negative and Kodaira dimension zero are very similar, there is a big, big difference in what this conjecture means. And for Kodaira dimension zero, we do not get this reduction to algebraic Brouwer Manin obstruction. Okay, so let me um, just mention so if X is a surface uh, over a number field, then Brouwer X bar fits into an exact sequence. On one side, you get H3XZ torsion. And on the other side, you get a Q mod C to the second Betty number minus the Picard rank, geometric Picard rank. All of this is over. Okay, so if you remember when X is a K3 surface, what did you learn from Barely Alvarado's first lecture? You learned that B2 was 22 and rho was at most 20. So this is huge. Somewhat surprisingly, I'm just going to mention this as a remark. Uh, Skorbogatov and Zarin have showed that if X is a K3 surface over a number field, then Brouwer X mod Brouwer 0 of X is finite. Okay, so let's we have Brouwer X mod Brouwer 0. Uh, that goes to Brouwer X bar, and then the kernel of this is Brouwer 1, by definition. 
So this has tons and tons of room. It has at least a Q mod Z squared and usually way more room than that. Uh, so, I mean, you can have surfaces with Picard rank one and then you have a Q mod Z to the 21. And somewhere inside of there, you find this finite group, which is the thing which is important for arithmetic. And we're getting techniques to study this. I mean, I will talk about this more and also Verily Alvarado will talk about this more, but we're just starting to understand. We really have very, very few techniques which work for studying the quotient Brouwer X mod Brouwer one. And so there is a huge difference in understanding the arithmetic of Podira dimension zero surfaces compared to the arithmetic of geometrically rational surfaces. And it's because we have this huge uh, Brouwer group. Okay, I think I'll stop here. <laughs>